very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is currently running for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada, and she's graciously accepted a spot on the show to come talk about herself, her duty to serve, but also the vision for the Green Party and Canada. And with me today is uh, Sarah Gabrielle Barron. She is uh, going to talk for a few minutes here, but Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about your show. Thanks for doing this. So, Sarah, before we get started, I have asked every single political candidate, politician who has ever come on this show the exact same first question. You are no exception. And that question is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, this is kind of a long story, and it's a little, it's really personal, right? So, um, so my mom had cancer when I was growing up um, for a lot of my childhood. And uh, she passed away when I was 15. And um, and I'm really lucky. My parents both taught me how to feel comfortable in nature. And so for healing, I went into, well, in Ontario, we call it the bush, right? <laughs> we, went, we would go into the forest for um, for healing, right? And, um, and I came to realize that, you know, our planet is suffering in much the same way that my mother suffered. Um, and so my sense of duty to, um, to green politics as the only intelligent way of changing our society, um, stems from that. Um, you, you, you caught me off guard here, Sarah, because, uh, as someone who is about to start round four of treatments for cancer, this is not how I expected oh, this interview Chris. to start, but here we are. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm I, I, my family yeah. knows the struggle that you went through, so I can imagine that growing up and learning that that service and duty from your mother. Oh, Sarah, you got me right in the, the, the first five minutes, but here we are. Um, you know what? We're going to stay in touch after, Chris. We'll yes, we after. are. So let's yeah. let's yeah. talk yeah. about growing up. Because you, duty to serve can come in many different ways, whether it be volunteerism, whether it be through nonprofits. You've chosen the political route. You've chosen to give back politically. In 2006, you ran for the Green Parties. In 2021, you ran as an independent. Um, in 2022, though, you have decided to put your name forward for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada. What was that based on? What was that ultimately, at the end of the day, based on for you? I could, I could never just pick one thing. Um, you know, it's your your pathway is an evolution, right? It's a lifelong evolution. Um, so when I was 17, um, I read D. Grunin, which is a book about the inception, the beginning of the Green Party, even the Green Movement in Germany. And for me, I mean, I think every Green comes to the party in a different way for different reasons. Uh, and for me, what really caught my interest was that you know in Germany they were coming from the like power corrupt right <laughs> an absolute power world's worst experience with that truism and they were saying how do we ensure that we create a political system where that can never ever happen again and so they had four key pillars and one of those four key pillars is participatory democracy um, which is now part of the global greens charter which is part of the green every green party whether it's regional or municipal or federal or international we all attest to the same six key principles and so for me that key principle of participatory democracy is the idea that you must have a decentralized power structure, that people must be in control of the decisions that affect their lives at the local level wherever possible. And very seldom and only when extremely necessary should power be centralized in a small group of people. So, um, so I really loved that vision and I joined the party in 2005. And um, you know, we live in an era of celebrity-based politics. Um, and we live in an era where, especially in Canada and the United States, we still have first past the post and it's very combative, right? So in order to win, <laughs> you have to play the game by the game's rules. So you have this, so this is a party with green parties worldwide. It's just a little bit more exacerbated, exaggerated in the green party of Canada, but to have this idea of a decentralized power structure 
um, a very grassroots organization where the power is in the people um, versus, you know, winning the game by the game's rules, very centralized, election-centric, um, leader-centric, um, kind of celebrity-based politics. Those two don't get along. And so you have this fundamental base that's kind of what I stand for. Um, and then you have, you know, people who who are just looking for somebody to take care of it for them. Right. <laughs> and I think in an era where people are, are fearful um, and things are getting more and more frightening with the state of our um, of our society. Right. It's our society. The things that are holding us together feel more and more threatened and fragile. And so that fear is going to continue and increase. And more and more people are going to try to give it up to a strong man who's going to make them feel safe. I'll take care of it for you or a strong woman. Um, and that is the exact opposite of what we need to do. We need to do it the green way. We all need to see ourselves as leaders. We all need to um, participate. We need direct democracy experiences as much as possible. And um, so the Green Party in the past year has really evolved really quickly um, and has brought in a lot of really cool volunteer-led um, experiences. And we had two virtual general meetings that were run by this huge bank of amazing volunteers. and. Um, they weren't necessarily all that great attended because we had had such a hard year previously. A lot of people had just kind of tapped out. Um, but but that's one of the reasons I ran. I really felt like the party had become what I had always wanted it to be. And uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to ensure that there was somebody at the top who was, instead of doing this, who was willing to give the collective the credit, who was willing to, to always you know, sure, I'm doing my best to try to shine um, and, and be that person that, that can do that celebrity-based politics. <laughs> but really, like, like I really want to give the collective the credit in everything I do. You are completely right. I have said since day one, we have gotten into more of a celebrity style politics and gotten away from policy politics. I remember the days when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, that policy won the day. And we've gotten further and further away from that. How do we bring that back, though? Because you're right. We have very strong personalities at the top of the tickets right now with Justin Trudeau, Pierre Polyev. How do you believe you would be able to bring that strong personality to the Green Party to help combat that celebrity style of politics and bring it back to a more policy driven politics? Well, um, it's really easy, actually. You just provide space where members can attend, especially in the Green Party, because we're small, right? So my my plan is to at least three nights a week, right out of the gate, have um, just just open Zooms where any member can attend, members only, um, and any member can attend. And one will be a focus on a national food security mandate. So the Green Party does have this massive bank of um, local organic farmers. And the climate crisis requires that we focus on food security. It is an absolute travesty that the other parties do not have a national food security mandate in place that is climate crisis ready. Uh, and so a second focus will be small scale energy resiliency solutions. Again, Greens are the experts in every community right across the country on small scale energy solutions. So we need to get each other together and talk about how, like, like I'm, it's not populism. It's it's just reality. It's very practical. Greens are very, very practical people, right? And so how do we showcase to Canadians that we are already doing it? We're already creating the infrastructures now that future generations will need to survive and thrive in the era of climate crisis and, frankly, the era of climate catastrophe, right? So, um, so, so I think that to answer your question, um, uh, it's, it's a question of the means creating the end. I think a lot of people in European style thinking, they have this end, this ideal in mind, and they and they try all these different ways to get there, right? The, the, the end justifies the means. Um, but I believe that if we just are true to participatory democracy, if we just for once try this beautiful experiment of direct democracy, of citizen-led experiments, um, and just getting together and talking, that, that naturally our membership will grow, our self-confidence will grow, our interconnections will grow, and the party will grow into itself. 
you you've seen the reports you've seen the news articles and i can imagine as a leadership candidate you try to stay away from the negative press that's being out there some are saying the climate crisis is too far gone some are saying that we are past the point of no return and we can't turn back while i wasn't going to talk about policy until later on in the interview you've brought it up so let's let's dive right into it because i think there's a lot of people who will be wondering what's your position and how do we fix this how do we fix this how do we start because if we're already too far gone if there are concerns that no matter what we do now the effects of climate change are already too far gone that we can't turn back time and what we do now is only going to be a drop in the bucket that we should have done 20, 30 years ago in 1980s when this was first brought to our attention. With the Greens, we're saying, let's do this now. <laughs> yes. Well, I had I had Dr. Trevor Hancock on the show, and he said the exact same thing. It's an issue that has not gone away, but people just don't want to talk about it. So how do we do this? Yeah. How do we fix this, but fix it in a way that we don't have to turn everything off tomorrow and hope for the best because let's be honest it's not going to happen so how how do you envision the green party and yourself as leader helping direct the conversation around climate change but also getting justin trudeau pierre polyev jugmeet singh e francois blanchette to start taking this freaking seriously Sorry, I'm a little passionate about yeah. it, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, we don't have time to wait. And like I was saying earlier, Greens are very practical, and we already are creating the infrastructures that tomorrow generations will require to survive and thrive, right? It does not have to be a doomsday scenario. We are on track to, to have way, like we've blown past 1.5 1. 1. in many climate scientists' estimations, right? I know the IPPC says we've got like two years left to try to keep it to 1.5. Many people believe we've already engaged too many feedback loops, like for example, the tundra melting and methane coming out of the tundra, right? Um, so, so it doesn't matter, we can't give up. And the, I refuse to be defeatist about it because a lot of the solutions that make our, our grandchildren's future livable are actually solutions that sequester carbon. So let's take, for example, um, Greens have been saying for more than a decade now that we can reduce our carbon footprint by at least six, by as much as sixty percent if we just focus on efficiencies and retrofits in our in our homes and in our businesses, right? And so that means this massive ballooning of our workforce of small contractors, and and they go into our homes and they and they help us with our efficiencies and our retrofits. Now the missing key in that scenario. Um, that will create massive, you know, just our economy will blossom because that puts money in the hands of small workers, right? Um, and small contractors. And so the reason, the only missing link to that is that we need, um, we need a, a section of the workforce that's trained in, in audits, in energy audits, right? And for all levels of industry, for homes, for, and, 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 the, and that's the problem, right, with what the government's doing right now, is no matter what they do around carbon pricing, the onus is on the industry to say, oh, we're making this much carbon, <laughs> right? We need, and that's the only, and, and, the, and the feeling is up to the provinces, because we do live in a, in a confederation where the provinces handle industry, environment, all those things, education. So at the very least, at the federal level, we could have a training program for auditors, so that right across the board, everybody's on the same page of, okay, what is your carbon footprint when that's, you know, whether you're in New Brunswick or BC, the auditor goes in with the same checklist to say, what is the carbon footprint of this home? What is the carbon footprint of this municipality? What is the carbon footprint of this extraction industry? What is the carbon footprint of this value added industry? So that's just one example. Um, food is another one, right? So industrial level agriculture is killing us. It is one of the most major contributors to the climate, to, to greenhouse gases. But small scale agriculture, um, otherwise known as no-till agriculture, um, is more local based. And it is a huge bank of carbon, sequestering carbon in soil. Is, is proven, it's scientifically proven to be a really valuable way to sequester carbon. So all of the solutions that the Greens present 
also grow our economy, also make our future more stable, also decrease carbon. It's just a win-win-win situation. I refuse to be doomsday about it. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to pose the Alberta question now because I'm an Albertan show and I guarantee you someone on the QE2 is listening to this episode as it airs or later on and yelling at me if I do not ask this question. Alberta's economy is tied heavily to the oil and gas industry. It is what it has been for years and years and years. While I understand that we need to transition away from it, what is your policy? What is your policy on the oil and gas industry? And do you see a future in Canada with a uh, resource sector in Alberta, which includes oil and gas? It's got to stop. It's got to stop. It's killing us, right? But who the heck am I? And who the heck is the Green Party? You folks live there. It, you have a really strong economy in Alberta, and you are leading the change. Some of the biggest solar farms on, in North America are in Alberta. Drake's Landing, which is one of those key um, communities that we point to that uses um, solar capture and geothermal. I mean, please check out Drake's Landing. It's the coolest community, and, and nobody talks about it. Every single new build should be based off Drake's Landing, and that's an Alberta innovation. So, so, you know, with the money that you have from the oil and gas sector, you should be leading the transition, not the Greens, not the Feds, Alberta should be leading the transition. You are have province. You need to lead the change. You can't, nobody else should be making you do it. We're all in this together. <laughs> so what does that transition look like to you? What does that transition look like to you? Because... I, I've spoken to many candidates and many politicians, and some say that if we transition, like some people have said, our economy is gone tomorrow. How do you see that transition? Is it 10, 15 years? I know you're saying it's not up to the Green Party, it's up to Alberta. But as a prime minister, if you are so lucky to be that, you will be dictating policies and procedures around the oil and gas industry. So what do you see? And I'm not trying to be combative here. It's just I'm the Alberta show. So if I don't ask no, this I question. Um, so I yeah, absolutely. And I've already answered that question, Chris, is, is, is that that is just transition. Our top focus, it is so easy to do and it will balloon our economy. And these are the same kinds of workers that are in the oil patch as we'll be transitioning to efficiencies and retrofits, right? Is, is, is you are the folks that will be hopefully trained in this really rapid transition out of the oil and gas into small scale local energy resiliency solutions at the community level, smart grids. We need to, we just need to change. We need to change fast and we need to use technology that is available now because that grows the economy. Right. So what the feds are doing right now is they're throwing really good money. At, like they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're funding with our tax dollars experiments that don't, that, that are totally unproven. Right. Um, so that small modular nuclear reactors, hundreds of millions of dollars, totally unproven technology. Um, the uh, green hydrogen, right. Green hydrogen is a ruse being used by, by LNG. Really, green hydrogen really only works at very high temperatures. The best application for that is in, is in cement, <laughs> and it's and it's being abused. And and carbon sequestration experiments are, are getting millions and millions of dollars. It's a complete waste. Can we please focus on technologies that are small scale? The, and that's the problem, right? Is that the other parties need to maintain centralized control of our lives, and the new economy is decentralized. So like I was saying earlier, you don't need the prime minister to tell you what to do other than hopefully providing a, a nationwide training program for energy auditors. What we need to do is organize at the local community level. And that's what Greens stand for. That's what participatory democracy needs. You, so you, just, everybody oh. needs to be a leader. Everybody needs to be a leader. It is the climate crisis. It is now our grandchildren's future may be unlivable unless we create these infrastructures for them now. You, you you openly talked in your uh, opening uh, launch of your campaign about nuclear energy and how you want to trans like you you want it gone you want it gone tomorrow and I'm just I'm paraphrasing here because you're probably going to be able to put it more eloquently than I will ever be able to let's put it this way um, 
why why do you believe that why do you believe nuclear energy is the wrong way to go because saskatchewan it has a very large uranium mining deposit you have uh pickering you have nuclear you have darlington nuclear you have bruce uh, and then you have premiers higgs mo i think ford if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong and kenny all saying small nuclear reactors is the way to go but you're saying no let's not why is that well, how long do you have? <laughs> as long um, as you want to take, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started at the basic level. Our first key principle, remember I was in the inception of the, of the movement, of political philosophy. Our first key principle is ecological wisdom. And there is absolutely nothing ecologically wise about the entire uranium fuel chain, beginning, middle, and end. It, it is an affront to nature to mine this stuff. And indigenous nations at the very beginning said, do not go there. Do not go deeper than a shovel or a hand swift. Do not go there. This is a dangerous place. And that was in the oral recognition of all of those treaties covering those areas. And it's been abrogated. It's been broken. Um, so I was a little overwhelmed when I started really digging in and learning the truth about small modular nuclear reactors. And a really good website is ccnr.org. Um, Dr. Gordon Edwards is a Canadian hero. He's been doing it his entire life. He ran against Pierre Elliott Trudeau <laughs> and was one of the reasons why I said, okay, I'm running against O'Toole, right? I can do, if, if Gordon can do this, I can do this. <laughs> um, I, I think you might be muted. I can't hear you all of a sudden, Chris. Oh no! I apologize. I I just I usually mute myself while while the other person's talking, so that way my dogs, okay. who have the tendency to bark during interviews for some strange reason, don't come over the noise, and they were barking. <laughs> so I do apologize. But go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, I was a little overwhelmed by just the amount of frightening information um, and the fact that Canadians just don't know the real truth about these small modular nuclear reactors. So I started doing my own podcast. Um, and it's called Radioactive in all caps. It's on Anchor FM, it's on Spotify, uh, it's on Google Podcasts. And so in Radioactive, I don't do any talking really. I just ask questions of Canadians living in radioactive neighborhoods. So you have, you talked about Northern Saskatchewan. It's got a lot of large uranium deposits still, but the entire Northern Saskatchewan watershed is a, is a radioactive waste nightmare that is unfixable. Um, you know, you cannot eat the fish out of Lake Athabasca, and you never will be able to ever. So when the climate crisis comes, and and you know, heaven forbid, people have to survive off the land. If it's really bad, if we really don't make this transition fast, um, then then you won't be eating the fish out of Lake Athabasca unless you want cancer. <laughs> you know, people in people in Ottawa do not know that there is tritium and strontium ninety in their drinking water. And when they do find out, the authorities say, oh, it's in such small amounts. There is no safe amount of radionuclides. We started out talking about cancer. So, so Canada has a radioactive waste legacy that has no solution. This stuff lasts for a million years. Like humans can't even conceive a thousand years into the future. And, and the problem with the half-lives is that people assume that the half-lives decrease. Some of the half-lives become more radioactive. So 500 years, maybe one of, and, and there's a bunch of them. It's very difficult science. And so Dr. Gordon Edwards, who I mentioned earlier, he calls uranium a shapeshifter, right? We're, we're messing with technology we don't understand. But for me, the, and, and Canadians are, are being absolutely clear. Canadians do not know the truth. But for me, the scariest part of the conversation around small modular nuclear reactors is that um, the Crown in Canada no longer has control. Stephen Harper and Pierre Polyev in 2015 abdicated um, their, their Crown duty to protect us. And they gave control of our nuclear secrets and our nuclear materials and our nuclear technologies to none other than SNC Labla. <laughs> under the guise of a misnamed organization called the Canadian National Energy Alliance. And um, and they fired uh, more than 3,000 employees in one year. And so of the 40 employees left, if you think that, you know, an SNC level in Pigway came into the room and said, oh, these are really cool designs, and took them and potentially sold them to a private industry, like, I don't know, uh, Moltex, 
<laughs> right? And so this is the problem is that can do fuel contains plutonium. Plutonium um, does not exist in the universe until humans created it. It is the world killer. Enough plutonium to hold in the palm of your hand can level Calgary like that. And so the way to get it is to extract it from solid can do fuel or reprocess it. There's a bunch of different technologies and it's, and it's an explosion of technologies right now and they're all being approved by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. <laughs> so what's happening on the Bay of Fundy, um, what's happening at Chalk River at the headwaters of the Ottawa River watershed, what's happening at Darlington, what's happening at Stephen Harper's outfit, Terrestrial in Oakville, what's happening at um, Mark Carney's outfit, Westinghouse in Burlington, what's happening at um, in the middle of Peterborough, um, uh, Peterborough, in Peterborough, right? That small town in, in Southern Ontario. Um, there's a factory there that's owned and controlled by BWXT, the United States largest nuclear weapons producer. Um, they are all meddling with reprocessing technology. So in the 1970s, Canada gave um, India and a bunch of other countries um, reprocessing technology. And India attained the nuclear bomb in the 70s, and everybody looked to Canada because it was our fault. And so Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jimmy Carter placed a moratorium at that time on reprocessing for plutonium extraction technology. And now Justin Trudeau and, and conservatives, they're all in cahoots, all of them are, are like, okay, let's, let's, let's open that Pandora's box. And the idea is to sell, so Canada's going to be the guinea pig for these small modular nuclear reactors. There's at least nine designs approved, rolling ahead, and Canada's going to be ground zero for a new nuclear weapons arms race, because the idea is to sell these little guys to small countries around the world. Wow. Uh, that is in depth and I'm very happy. We could probably, we could probably talk about this for just an hour in itself, but I want to get back to a policy that you, you talked about earlier on as well, and that's food insecurity. We are in a time in this country where people are struggling, struggling hard. Prices are going up. Food is going up. We have territories like Nunavut and Northwest Territories where they have seen prices significantly skyrocket compared to, say, Toronto, Calgary, Ottawa. And we are now in a moment when we're looking for what's next because we saw what happened in the pandemic with food prices, with the supply chain, and we want a fix. Food insecurity is one of these things that we have to address moving forward. What do you see as your role as leader of the Green Party, but also as the Green Party in Parliament to address these issues? Are there policies that you would love to see the government put forward to help address food insecurity around Canada right now? Um, yeah, because Canada is the era of climate crisis coming down the pipe. Canada is going to be a half country. There are some countries that will that will cease to exist due to desertification and flooding. Um, and so we need to have not just a food security plan, but we need to have a climate refugee plan that is intelligent. And the other parties have completely abdicated their, their duties to keep us safe in, in, a, in the climate crisis future. So, so the Green Party is small. And like I said, we're very practical. And I will be getting us together at least once a week to have open forum discussions that our members will control and we will create best practices. We will create a bank of information that any Canadian can access. Um, we will create, so, so, so two prompt, right? So, so providing information to Canadians right now on how to do cooperatives, how to do community shared agriculture how to do no-till agriculture, because unfortunately from that generation divide, right, of our great-grandparents who, like everybody did no-till agriculture, <laughs> to now we're, we're totally reliant on, on this industrial system that is that is fragile. The industrial food system is very, very fragile. The international industrial food system is very, very fragile. You know, our monetary system right now is fragile. So all of us go to the grocery store and get our food, right? We have forgotten how to be self-resilient. We've forgotten how to be community level resilient around food security. And Greens are the ones who have that bank of knowledge. And we're not there yet. We're going to be okay, right? It's not totally collapsing around us right now. It's, in, it's 
required that we start to create those infrastructures now because things could get really ugly 50 years, 100 years in the future. And, and so we have to be intelligent in our planning. And the Green Party is small, but we are very mighty and we do have that intelligent, we have that bank of knowledge. So, so locally, yes, I'm um, just showcasing, getting us together, showcasing, creating best practices, working with other organizations that are already doing it because Greens are a lot of us, right? A lot of us are in NGOs that are working on this already. Um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of creating a website. Maybe it's just a matter of providing links. I'm not a farmer. I'm not one of those Greens, um, but it is my job as leader to facilitate those meetings and I will be. Um, and then the uh, next level up is a national food security mandate that is climate crisis aware, um, that says, okay, we need to transition away from industrial agriculture that has controlled our lives for the past 60 years. It's only been 60 years, really, between 60 and 80 years that industrial level agriculture, international level, you know, free trade agreements have controlled our food systems. We can, we can transition, it's not the end of the world. We will be okay. Humans are smart, humans are resilient. We can make this change. We live in one of the most prosperous countries in the world right now. And I am not speaking out of line when we say we have people struggling within this uh, this country. And I am not speaking out of line when I say we have First Nations communities that still have boil water advisories on their First Nations reserves. How do you, and I say this as, uh, as I want to try and word this correctly, so please bear with me, Sarah, here. Do you believe that Canada has failed the First Nations communities of this country when we still are living in 2022 with boil water advisories for some of our, for some of the First Nations people of Canada? Yeah, it's far more than just boil water advisors, right? So, so I'm really grateful to Lorraine Reckman's and Indigenous Peoples Advisory Circle that's really um, fed a, a movement within our party of an awareness of what's really going on in craft Indigenous relations. And so there are two, um, two policies that members approved in our last round of member-led policy process that are central to, um, to my platform. And the most important really is, um, is aligning Canada's constitution with UNDRIP. So the problem is that, that we have um, really racist laws <laughs> controlling that relationship between the Crown and Indigenous nations. And that needs to change. And we do have a bank of law that we can rely on both before and after our constitution. So our constitution is, the, the 1867 constitution is racist. The Indian Act is deeply racist. And it was, they were tools for um, subjugation and oppression and, and deep harm, right? Um, so, so we have the Royal Proclamation, we have the Queen's Bargain, uh, those are, those are, we have the treaties, um, and those are legal systems that we can and should rely on. And now we have UNDRIP. So aligning Canada's constitution with UNDRIP, plus also relying on those almost pre-constitution treaties and laws, um, you know, we can really rapidly transform our legal system. And if you look at the Blueberry, um, the recent Blueberry um, Supreme Court announcement you see, then that it's happening really fast. And it includes recognizing traditional governance systems. So the residential school experience was so horrific um, that it really, really damaged a lot of First Nations abilities to, um, to connect with their own traditional governance systems. And now we see this resurgence of traditional governance systems and there is a tension with Indian Act Bank Councils. So in my plank, in my policy, one of the most important things that Greens and Canadians everywhere can do is, um, is recognize what's going on in divide and conquer tactics um, that are still at play. So, so those previous laws that I, that I referenced, including the Royal Proclamation of 1763, that foundational document in the Crown Indigenous Relations, says that the Crown is the only body that can make land use deals with Indigenous nations. And they don't just make it with one little population, they make it with the nation. So like the Anishinaabek nation. Right, <laughs> and um, and so so 
what we have instead is that they devolve that, they abdicate that responsibility, they give it to the provinces. Well, the province is still a crown, and they abdicate that, and they give duty to consult to um, to private corporations who go in and basically bribe um, a really, really struggling, um, hurting band council, Indiana band council, right? Like our people are hungry, they don't have water, there, there's suicides in, in a lot of the far north reserves. Um, you know, they're, they're dealing with intergenerational traumatic response from the decades of genocide, frankly, at the residential schools. Um, so, so that is something that we all need to stand up for, is a really strong change in our legal system, and the Crown can no longer abdicate its duty by, devol by devolving duty to consult to private corporations. That is wrong. That is, that is, we are breaking our own laws every single time that happens, and every time there is a new mine, there is a new logging road, there is a new, all of these resource extractions, they are breaking the law. Um, so that's one. And another one that I'd just like to highlight within my platform is um, that I do believe that it behooves all of us as Canadians, whether you're an NGO or you're a politician, to really focus on language revitalize, retention and revitalization. I'm a high school teacher and my degree is in Indigenous Studies and Politics. I teach on and off reserve. Most of my students are Indigenous from the Anishinaabek Nation. And, and, and it's an emergency situation that the languages for a lot of First Nations um, could go extinct like with this generation. And that is a direct result of the horrors of the residential school decades. So it behooves us as Canadians, as allies, to really do everything we can to just fund the, the, the language revitalization and retention um, programs that they are running themselves. And they, they could do some help. I, I'm just cautious of time here, and I want to thank you for answering all these questions about policy, but I have one last policy question before we move. Not really a policy question, but more of a Green Party policy. You are going to be the leader of the Green Party of Canada. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not speaking at a turn that if you go to speak to a Green Party member in BC or here in Calgary or in Winnipeg, downtown Toronto, Montreal, or St. John's, Newfoundland, you will hear something different from every single one of those members. And the issues that are facing people in BC may not be the issues that are facing people in Calgary. Yes, there are some overlying things, but the nitty gritty policies that they want to see in their own provinces. How do you see yourself as the facilitator of the different unique perspectives that the Green Party has going forward? Yeah, um, I, I exactly. It's it's like I was like we started our conversation. Is the the key principle of participatory democracy is that magic ingredient that we've been missing out on since I joined in two thousand five. That's why I'm running for leader. I've been waiting for that promise to come true. And what that means is a leader's office that is willing to give the collective the credit that reads our policy book instead of just ignoring it that doesn't say oh i'm the best and therefore i'm going to give you a platform every four years it's like a dump of fertilizer right <laughs> and, and only certain plants can take in all that information we need to have a leader's office that provides cohesion of political messaging weekly to electoral district associations in terms of newsletters and a leader's office that has a shadow cabinet that says okay shadow cabinet at least once a month provide an open top policy tabletop where any member can attend and, and, and the leader's office that says, I'm going to create one pagers, policy one pagers. Members ask me to do this as leader, create policy one pagers that so that we're election ready all the time, that we have a bank for every single issue. We have one page document that you can hand out to all your candidates, that you are handing out to all of your um, electoral district association leaders, um, that makes us election ready all the time. And it needs to be a collective. It cannot just come from one person. Do you see yourself being able to do that? Because um, the Green Party has been through a tumultuous year. I, I think I can say that as nicely as possible. Um, and we are seeing the Green Party trying to figure out the path forward. When you're talking to Green Party members from across Canada, from coast to coast to coast, are they saying they want they want stability. They want someone who will come in and bring back that stability that we are so desperately missing in politics. Or are they talking about we need X, Y, and Z done from this new leader? What is the message that the Green Party members are telling you from a leadership perspective? 
um, they're telling us that they want the drama to stop, right? Um, and so... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at and that. So, it's just, you are not the first person who I've heard that come from before. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, it is because, like I was saying, it's not just the Green Party of Canada. It's this fundamental difference between a grassroots style of organization and a hierarchical, leader-centric, um, celebrity-based politics, you know, win at all costs. Um, and so I really do feel that if my message resonates, that members will choose me as the leader and it will become a volunteer driven organization. There's no way that I can do this myself. You know, I'm just I'm just providing um, a vision. Um, and and when members say, yeah, we like Sarah's vision, we've been waiting for true participatory democracy too. Um, we, you know, we're on the ropes here. This party could dissolve. Um, it's time to give that promise a chance. It's trying to try this grand experiment of direct democracy, of participatory democracy, of true democracy. Um, and and if they vote me in as leader, then we're going to go there. We'll do it. <laughs> but it certainly won't be me. It will become, you know, like I value the volunteers. I value our electoral district associations. Um, and I value our member-led policy process. So, I, and, and I will do both, right? I will provide on the national stage that strong voice. And I will also give the collective the credit at all times. So we are a few weeks, if not a few days, away from this uh, the membership cutoff for the Green Party of Canada. October 19th, if I'm not mistaken, is when you can sign up to vote on the in the November leadership election. So take as long as you want here, Sarah, when I ask you this question. Oh, and Sarah's back. <laughs> take as long as you want when I ask this question to you. Why should people sign up for the Green Party of Canada and put their trust in you as the next leader of the Green Party of Canada? And like I said, take as long as you want whenever you're ready. Well, I'm hoping to appeal to two um, kind of cohorts of Greens, right? I'm hoping to appeal to the Greens like me, um, who have been really disappointed in the way we've gone about things. Um, we, we've just focused too much on playing the game by the game's rules and doing the way the other parties do. And a lot of, in 2019, I sat down and in five minutes, I had a list of 35 Greens who had left the party, um, just in frustration. Uh, you know, the, the ones who were waiting for this style of democracy to happen at our party. And I'm asking them to come back. I'm asking that a lot of them know me, right? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, like I have put my teaching career on hold. I, I, I just really have believed in the green movement since I was a teenager. I believe that the green movement is the hope for humanity. I've believed that my whole life. I'm willing to put everything on the line for this. And I'm doing it now. And and please believe in it with me. Um, so so that's one cohort I'm hoping to appeal to. I'm also hoping to appeal to um, to young Canadians, right? That that because they are the ones who are terrified. They are the ones who have climate anxiety. And the Green Party champions their future. The Green Party is the one who says we can do this differently. The Green Party is the one who is not in climate denial. It's the only political movement in Canada that is not in climate denial. It's the only one that says, yeah, capitalism is killing us. Um, you don't need to be afraid. We're not radicals here. Um, we have been providing really good plans to quickly but gently evolve us to a post-capitalist society, something that is intelligent, that makes sense. We have macroeconomic and microeconomic tools to do this. And that they're all in my platform and they're all in the member led policy process that we've been creating for decades. So it is going to be okay, young people. We hear you, we see your, we see how afraid you are. And 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 this party is your home. And this movement is your home. And you will create the policies that control our country going forward with the Green Party of Canada through these mechanisms that I'm talking about. Sarah, we have spent the last, I want to say, 45 minutes, I just checked the timer here, talking about a lot of things. And I know, I know, because I always get emails after these interviews where someone yells at me, says, why didn't you ask this question? Or why didn't you ask this question? Well, it's my show and I get to ask the questions I think are important to people. So here we are. <laughs> but Sarah, for those who do want to ask you a question, who want to reach out, get involved in your campaign, possibly donate, possibly uh, sign up as a volunteer, how can they do that? How can they reach out and ask questions if they have a follow-up to our conversation? 
Thank you so much, Chris. I, uh, my email is easy. It's sgb at greenparty.ca. And my website is easy to find. It's sarahgabrielbarrett.ca. I think it's the first thing you come up when you search my whole name. And uh, the donate form is, the button's right there. And uh, and I would love help because I have a very small team right now. I am a relative unknown on the national stage. And, uh, you know, in order to win something like this, you've got to have donations. And because because the party has been in real disarray, especially during this leadership race, um, donations are down. Um, and like I said, I don't, I don't really care. I mean, this is, this is it, right? <laughs> like our future is at stake. And I believe the Green Party of Canada is the only solution. It is the hope for humanity. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. It's hard, it's hard as a newbie to ask for donations, right? <laughs> it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> as a former but political yeah, yeah, uh, candidate, I know how to ask for money, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> But I, I do want to mention this to my viewers and to my listeners. For those who want to learn, reach out and learn a little bit more, Sarah's Twitter, Facebook, website, link to buy a membership, and email address are in the YouTube show notes and the podcast show notes. So scroll down. If you're driving, please pull over and then scroll down or wait till you get home and then scroll down and check it out because democracy only happens when you actually get involved and learn about the candidates. And that's what I've always tried to do on this show is just be a little bit of a venue for people to learn about the candidates. But Sarah, thank you so much for spending the last 45 minutes, almost 50 minutes talking about yourself, talking about some of the policies and your vision for the Green Party of Canada. It's been wonderful. And I look forward to talking to you again on October 23rd for our debate that we'll be hosting live at 430 Mountain Standard Time. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you providing these venues, this is kind of like what I'm talking about with my platform, right? It's just like, thank you for providing this. And uh, and I do want to continue to talk, uh, you know, if, if you ever want to talk about the journey that you're going through with your family, just reach out, okay? Will do. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day. I know I just said go follow Sarah and go reach out to Sarah on social media. But after you do that, put down your social media for at least five minutes a day because it helps our democracy, helps our society, and it helps us be a better people when we actually talk to each other instead of yelling into the Twitter void and the social media voids. So with that, this has been another great edi live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Talk to you later. Thank you.